This is BBC World News and Hard Talk with Stephen Sacker. More than two years after the Sri Lankan army conclusively defeated the separatist Tamil Tigers, there is powerful evidence to suggest both sides committed serious war crimes in the closing stages of their conflict. A UN panel concluded as much in April last month. Graphic video footage screened on British television added to the international pressure for an independent investigation. My guest today is Sri Lankan MP and advisor to the President on Reconciliation, Rajiva Wijasinha. Can there be reconciliation without justice? Rajiva Sinha, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Do you believe it is important to get to the truth of what happened in that closing phase of the war between the Sri Lankan army and the Tamil Tigers? I think truth is always important. I think sometimes truth has various connotations put to it, which lead to falsehood as well. And I think we should actually confine ourselves to facts but always bearing in mind that the future is much more important than the past. Yeah, facts are important, aren't they? And I just wonder why, for example, it seems the Sri Lankan government, two years and two months after the end of that war, still doesn't have any clear idea of how many civilians were killed. Oh, I think uh, we have a very clear idea of how many were killed many altogether. Were killed? Uh, the figure I've sort of given, uh, which I said two years ago, is about 5,000 altogether. And that, to be clear, is in the final offensive. We're talking really about the five months of 2009, maybe the tail end of 2008. I think well. that's the important part, because, of course, one of the factors that I think no one recognizes is that we ourselves were deeply concerned about civilian casualties. I was head of the Peace Secretariat during that period, and I would every morning monitor what appeared on Tamil net and have a report and if it struck me that something had been excessive I would ask for reports from the Air Force and the Army. The problem is though that nobody mm. regards that figure you've just given me of 5,000 civilians killed as credible do they? The UN panel set up by the Secretary General reckons that there is credible evidence that 40,000 civilians were killed in that final well, phase Well I think of if the you war. read the UN panel's report thoroughly which very few people had done it's not really a UN panel report. It was appointed by the Secretary General to advise him on accountability issues. Unfortunately, certain people, including your former Foreign Secretary, decided from the beginning that there needed to be a war crimes, crimes tribunal. He said as much in the House of Commons. And unfortunately, some people sitting on this um, uh, advisory committee also took up that approach. We had evidence, for instance, that in May 2009, people were applying to sit on a war crimes tribunal that the UN was setting up. I'm sorry, are you, are you calling into question the integrity of the people on the UN panel? No, I'm calling into question their judgment. I'm also calling into question the fact that they seem to have decided to sit in judgment when that was not what they were meant to do. For instance, when Sri Lanka decided that they would not come into the country, the Secretary General said, that's fine because they're only here to advise me, but they protested. They saw themselves as sitting as an inquiry board. They clearly felt that not being allowed into the country inhibited their ability to actually investigate what had happened. Well, if the Secretary General who appointed them thought it shouldn't, because that was not what they were appointed to investigate. with respect, the Secretary General wasn't doing the investigation. They were. No, and the as Secretary you well General know, they're all highly them. credible people. I mean, um, they are, well, I'm not to go so through, sure. To go through it, they're the former Indonesian Attorney General. They're a South African lawyer who sat on the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Commission there, and also one of America's leading legal scholars, Steve well, Ratner. Steve Ratner, who has written accusing the Sri Lankan government of being an apartheid type regime, which is complete nonsense. Uh, Kiki Darusman, the former UN Attorney General, if you remember, was the head of the UN Hu uh, Indonesian Human Rights Commission, and at that stage he didn't actually allow many investigations to many things, but he has since taken up a very, I think, remarkably let's say, active career working for the UN. But let us assume that they are sincere people. I think what you also have to recognize is there is what I call a human rights industry. 
and that seems to look at things from a particular perspective and not the political yeah, issues. Well, you, you can call into question the validity of their findings, but there is a problem for you at the moment. Both the UN panel and the video evidence all appear to point in one direction. To quote the UN panel's conclusions, the conduct of the war represented a grave assault on the entire regime of international law, and there is the video evidence to back that suggestion up. Well, I think you've rather put the cart before the horse. I don't know whether you've ever heard of Wittgenstein's statement about someone who bought a second copy of the morning paper to make sure that what the first said was true. And this is really what we've got, because if you go through the Durrisman report, a lot of it is based on two sources. One is the Channel 4 material, because a lot of things they describe without saying where it came from is precisely what was on the Channel 4 stuff. The second is a lot of stuff is taken, some of it verbatim, from a book by a man called Gordon Weiss, who worked for the UN in rather junior capacity in Sri Lanka, and who tends to corroborate what they say. Now, when we tell people that what well, they say is correct... Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You're just, you, the, the, your answers are very complicated, but there are some very simple things are, that we, we should address. The Sri Lankan armed forces shelled hospitals, makeshift hospitals, but with red crosses uh, very visible, and with coordinates and locations which have been given to the Sri Lankan army by the ICRC. We know that as fact, do we not? No, what we know is that shells did fall in hospitals. I have with me the documents I collected. You know, some of you think you cared about civilians. I did as well. I got these every day, and I would ask questions. And if you look at the number of times that Tamil Net alleged a particular hospital was shelled, uh, it couldn't exist at all. We know, for instance, that in January, uh, towards the end of January, there were several allegations. The Americans, who actually gave us what I thought was a very well-constructed set of questions, actually helped us by saying, you know, we had reports of this being shelled, but our aerial photograph showed it was tainted. Sure, but the problem with your argument is that it was UN officials, indeed former military people, who understood the nature of shell fire very well, who were quite clear in saying that the shells came from, from the Sri Lankan army I'm positions. afraid that is not true. The person uh, I, I, who I think you'll find it is true. No, I'll tell you exactly what happened as far as I'm concerned in terms of direct discussion with people. Don't forget this is a third hand. In January, there was a report about people being dead. And we had the head of the UN calling us up on January 26th, which is mentioned in Channel 4. And we checked on this. In the evening, the head of the UN, who is not interviewed by this panel, sent me an SMS, he said to my minister, saying, for information, we believe much of the shelling came from the LTT. Now, this I, guy, I, I, when I he came to see me... people who've seen the video evidence will be wondering, what on earth are you talking about? You've seen the evidence. It is quite clear that the shells were coming from Sri Lankan army positions. It would be ridiculous. And, you, and, and you, it is we've quite seen clear also that, that this happened repeatedly, repeatedly, not just on the January sorry, 26th you've occasion you've talked about, but all the way through to the middle of May. This sorry, happened repeatedly. Sorry, but you repeatedly. are saying that when you see a shot of a hospital, it came definitely from somewhere. This is what Chris Ditoa confessed to us when we spoke to him, it was not clear. And he finally told us there's only one shot of which he could tell the trajectory definitely. And he said that came from the LTT. This was the January one. Now, when you go on to the May ones, as I have said already, I'm sure shells from our side may have fallen on the hospitals. But what do you do? And I think the British government has shown us very clearly the answer. What do you do? when the LTT moves heavy weapons next to the hospital. Good, uh, do you ignore you. So it you, or not? You, you are, can't ignore it. You just said it. to me you are now sure mm -hmm. that Sri Lankan artillery shells landed on makeshift hospitals. No, I said towards I them. Uh, forgive they, me, unless I misunderstood you, you said moving on from the January 26th incident that uh, you were sure, there was a word you just used, sure that Sri Lankan shells landed on these makeshift hospitals. I said, on, I said in them. Look, if you look at what oh, I've got here... What's the difference here, between in and the on? If you are a patient the, in a ward which has been hit by a shell, if it lands in or on, what is the difference? Because the difference is between deliberate targeting and, as you saw recently in the NATO attack, you know, sometimes the um, technology, and we don't have as good technology as you, can go wrong, but there is a difference between deliberate targeting and near. Now, one of the things the report says is every hospital in the Vanni was deliberately shelled. I have, I have here the details well, of what that, happened. Do you know about that the Army had the coordinates because the ICRC has confirmed that they passed on coordinates. Yes, you also know that the international rules of war say that even if 
you have reason to believe that enemy action is coming from a hospital, you have no right to fire on that hospital without giving a clear notification and without giving a deadline. And that was not I done. I don't think you heard what the chap on the Channel 4 said. He said, if the hospital is being used for military purposes, you are allowed to fire so long as you fire on the, 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 the guns. I, you heard I, the guy I, yesterday. I, I think that's actually not right. I think that the, the clear international law says you have to notify, to warn, to set a deadline before you even consider shelling a well, hospital. Well, the Tigers had been told to remove their stuff from the hospitals. This had been repeatedly told them. And I think we could not allow them when they continue to keep their weapons there. That is clearly Just as said. you refuse to acknowledge culpability on the shelling of hospitals, though you have acknowledged that shelling of hospitals took place, do you also refuse to accept culpability when it comes to the images of detainees, prisoners, being shot, summarily executed? Stephen, I just have to correct you. I accept, I accept a responsibility for shelling of weapons. Culpability is a different word. If you, you are responsible of this for shelling weapons, if it falls on civilians through collateral damage, that is not culpability, that yeah, is responsibility. I, I said you didn't accept culpability, so what are you quarreling about? You actually about? said culpability for shelling yeah, hospitals. Yeah, I said you didn't accept culpability, you accepted that the shelling had taken no, you, place. You so let's move on now to summary no, executions. No, I should, should but you listen to it again. Okay. Summary executions. On the, the summary evidence executions, the I think what clear. we have said very clearly is if the details of any clear allegation is put before us, we will investigate. When Channel 4 first showed a video in August 2009, we asked them for the video. They wouldn't give it to us. In fact, Philip Alston of the UN asked them for the video. They wouldn't give it to him. He had to get it, and it was an altered version. I, looking at the It film, was an altered version. What do you mean? The, the video sent by journalists of democracy to Alston's experts was saliently different from the video shown by Channel you see, 7. You see, Channel 4 is quite plain. They have not tampered with this video in any way. You have alleged that they've backtracked on that claim, uh, that it's all legitimate and genuine. They have absolutely rejected that notion. They stand by every single piece of video, by its authenticity and by their journalism. So where does that leave you now? I'm sorry, what I said was not dead back. But I said the UN experts who first accepted the Channel 4 claim that this was straight from a mobile phone, have in their second analysis pointed out that what was shown was edited. Chris Christoph it was edited Hines, backwards. Christoph Hines, the UN uh, investigator with responsibility for looking at these charges, has said he does not doubt the authenticity of these videos. Well, I'm just telling you what his expert said. You cannot doubt the authenticity. Well, Christoph Hines, with all due respect, is the point man at the UN who is considering the, the authenticity of these videos. And he's Don't absolutely be silly. I mean, are we supposed to accept that what someone says simply because he's a point man is necessarily correct? But this I'm is the man who has consulted video expertise around the world. There have been many analyses run of these videos and the conclusion is they're genuine. No, they're generally genuine. You read those reports properly, which I suspect you haven't done, and you will find that of the three experts, there are people who say this video has been edited and it's shown upside down. What was filmed first is shown third. What was filmed, what was shown fifth, was taken at a different location, perhaps on a different date. And we are shown this by Channel 4, who never told us this. So they have not backtracked. But if the experts say this has been edited upside down, I think we have to ask why. This is the, all we're uh, asking. The and what these, what these guys say is that they asked for explanations from Channel 4, and they didn't get any. So please read these reports yourself. You are uh, an advisor to the president of Sri Lanka on reconciliation. I wonder, in that capacity, looking to heal wounds and to deliver a sense of justice and accountability, whether you've asked the president whether any of the Sri Lankan soldiers on those videos, apparently involved in the executions, have since been apprehended. You know, I haven't asked him that, but I have asked him with regard to other issues. Have any of them been apprehended? Be... Well, we don't know who they are because we can't well, go around. You've seen around the them. videos. Do you really think? It's that quite, some we of them can are full-face, quite clearly identifiable soldiers. It's not beyond the, the, the ability of your army, is it, to identify so the particular soldiers? I didn't parade involved. on 100,000 people. Are you really sort of serious? I, I'm sorry, I'm amazed. You're telling me that when the most egregious human rights abuses are seen on a video involving soldiers from your army, no effort is made 
to bring those soldiers to book. Oh, come on, Stephen. What we have said is we've asked for dates. If you remember, Channel 4 said that the first video was taken on January 19th, which turned out to be false. They haven't denied it now, but they have actually now said it happened on a different date. The second video that was shown was declared by the experts to have been microdated, or whatever it's called, on July 16th or 19th, which was long after the events. If they give us a date and a time, we can then find out who was somewhere there. What I have advocated, for instance, in terms of inquiry, is one incident which was reported on Channel 4 and which was reported us before, and I have suggested this should be looked at, which is the uh, allegation about um, killing people who wanted to surrender. We have a date on that. We have your, people, uh, your, and I think your, that is something that needs to be investigated. Yes. I have kept saying that. You're here in London, it seems, to try to defend the Sri Lankan government at a time of great difficulty for your government, because not just the British government, but the US government, the European Union, are all saying that your stance in the wake of this video and the UN panel report is unacceptable. There has to be a new, a thorough, and independent investigation of all these war crimes charges. Why won't your government agree? Because we're not here to keep your electorate happy. If David Miliband confessed to the Americans that his purpose was to win elections, we think it's very shabby to put other countries at risk. The State Department, for example, says just the other day that international accountability mechanisms can become appropriate when a state fails to meet its obligations. Does that not worry you at all? When a state fails to meet its obligations, you know perfectly well that your country and the Americans will not allow the international community, as it's called, anywhere near. I know that they think they are the international community, so they don't need other people. But look at Bloody Sunday. Look at how long the inquiry took. Yeah, so it, please remember I, that I, it is the internal I mechanism that's important. I understand you can just throw different cases at me from around the world. And of course, we put the searching and the tough questions to people responsible for all sorts of different international interventions. I've it just so happens your that you are here days. speaking for Sri Lanka. You are an advisor to the Sri Lankan president. So it probably would be helpful if we could just stick to what's happening in Sri Lanka. But you're the one who introduced the British and the European and the American politicians. Absolutely, who are calling for your government to well, undertake an independent, thorough and investigation. And I just made the point that if you are producing do. them as evidence, you better think again. But if you're saying, I, Stephen Sackur, who is idealistic and genuine, think that you should have an inquiry, let me tell you that I would perfectly agree that the Sri Lanka government is pledged in the event of evidence being given to us that we can count on, as opposed to different dates and edited videos to look into it. I have already told you two or three incidents, and I'm sure there are more in that Channel 4 episode as opposed to 59 minutes, that need further investigation. I think they mentioned one day in one of those episodes, confusing with the others, but where they said day, I uh, think that is serious. I yeah, quite agree with let's, you. Um, let's look at your reconciliation remit. There is, of course, in Sri Lanka a Learned Lessons Commission, which is very much not a war crimes investigation. It's called a Learned Lessons Commission. Are you satisfied with the way that's working? Do you believe it's achieving anything when it comes to yes, learning lessons I, and I think it is. I mean, I tend to believe that most things can go more quickly than they do. Uh, as I said, I'm very critical of my people in Sri Lanka about how slow they are. I thought there should have been another interim report, and I said so. But of course, we can't affect the commission. Do you, I think do you that agree with the UN Secretary General's panel that the Learned Lessons and Reconciliation Commission is deeply flawed? It cannot meet the Secretary General's commitment to accountability. Not at all. I don't agree with them in the slightest, because I think they were asked to appear before the panel. They refused. We actually asked some of the people who have given the evidence to the um, UN panel to give the evidence to the LLRC, they refused, and then they say they're not good enough. I mean, how can a commission which is collecting evidence deal with matters which are not brought before it and given to someone else and which are still not given to us? We've kept asking Channel 4 for this evidence. It's all, I um, think what is important, though, Stephen, is what the Sri Lankan people are doing. Why are there tens of thousands of Sri Lankan troops uh, occupying military positions all over the north of the country when the war, as your army declared it so triumphantly, was over more than two years ago? Very simply because there is fears, and I'm not able to tell them not to uh, abandon these fears, I mean to abandon these fears, that there are people trying to revive the LTT and terrorism. My personal belief is that the people of Sri Lanka largely would not worry about this, but when you have British politicians 
telling us to talk to the rump of the LTT here in preference to the Sri Lankan people, we fear that the money that was collected could be well, used the, to bad ends. So we have to be careful. Uh, let's not but focus I just on what the British government the says. The Indian Prime Minister on the 29th of June said, our emphasis is to persuade the Sri Lankans to move towards institutional reforms where Tamil people will have a feeling that they are equal citizens, not second class that citizens. That is I am as well. But we have to, uh, the reason he well, used it, those it, words... It's a very odd way of going about it. For example, you know, the Sri Lankan government in theory has had a long-term commitment to devolution of power. Devolution of power simply has not happened in the north of the country. The no, 13th we, Amendment, it's, it's called, it hasn't been applied to the north of the country. Because we haven't had an election, but we're planning to do one soon. We're having local elections. The LTT didn't allow us to have local elections for 10 or 20 years. When we did have elections in the north, they murdered three mayors. I think the fact that we've now got an opposition mayor who's functioning is a good thing. Uh, with respect, I'm sure you know much better than I do, that the Tamil National Alliance has had its meetings broken up by the army in the last few weeks and they're only actually fighting local town council elections. No, you're perfectly right. There was a meeting and I've asked for information about that. We discussed that with the Tamil National Alliance. As I told them, uh, they benefited so much from it. By, I'm sure it wasn't them, but they were really quite happy about it. If you are interested in achieving this accountability and asking difficult questions, how, how many Tamil houses have been occupied by the Sri Lankan army, do you think? Have you asked that question? Well, I don't know the actual number but a but large number given back it's a very important yeah, part Stephen, of reconciliation what you don't understand it? is that the reconciliation is about the people who suffered in the Vani primarily the political institutions we have managed to r return back to their homes uh, almost all the 300,000 you know perfectly well that last in 2009 we were told that one of the reasons Britain was concerned was they feared that we would keep these people in internment camps for years we've had not a word of thanks many, for the fact that we've camps, returned how many Tamils are still thousand. held in indefinite detention no one's held in detention about 15,000 no 000. one's held in detention no because the camps are, were but opened in 2009 the Prevention of Terror Act is still being employed and there are still Tamils who for years have been in detention and continue to be so in detention. Stephen, I thought you were talking of the people who were displaced in the camps. We were accused of keeping internment camps. Almost no, all I'm of them. Currently talking detention. Detention, the figure is something like 4,000. We brought it down from a much larger figure. When I was Secretary of the Ministry, we had a committee, and my line always to the Attorney General was either prosecute or release. We moved very quickly on that in 2009. In the last few months, we've uh, had an, I mean, I'm not Secretary of the um, Ministry anymore, but the commitment is there. But you're perfectly right, that's something on which we need to move much more quickly, because we've either got to prosecute or to release. Now, on that issue, many papers are with the Attorney General's department. There are many people, including my former minister and the Attorney General, who are trying to move. But you have to grant these things are slow. I mean, you people well, don't I say a word about uh, one uh, more, yes, do you? you? You don't you, worry you, about one more because your well, terrorists seem dangerous you, 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 to you. In a very Aren't interesting they? fashion, you've just opened up a real difference between you and the government there. But I just wonder how long you're prepared to work with this government if they don't listen to you. For example, your own party's website, the Liberal Party, says that the current constitution gives far too much power to the president. Sri Lanka lacks a system of checks and balances. This is your own political party criticising the authoritarian uh, system which your country currently has with a massively powerful executive of president. Course, and we have been criticising it from 1977 or uh, 78 onwards because we believe one of the fundamental flaws of the Sri Lankan constitution is that we have grafted the presidential system onto Westminster, which reduces the power of Parliament considerably, and that system is both illogical and should be changed, but changing it requires a two-thirds majority. And when you're in a coalition, as the Liberal Party here knows full well, you don't actually run the show, but you have to actually put your ideas forward, hope that they will have some impact, and make sure that nothing new that is against your principles will happen. But what the Constitution and it exists is not something you or I can change. You may just find that you can't achieve reconciliation without justice. Oh, I think we do want justice, but we also want reconciliation and we want a prosperous future for our people. And we would welcome the support of what I would call the reasoner people in countries like this for that purpose. Rajiva Wijisinha, we have to leave it there. Thanks for being on Hard Talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed.